Welcome to the Apostolic Keynote Podcast from Kingdom Faith Church. This message is by Colin Urquhart. In 1 John chapter 3, we read how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. We're going to think for a few minutes this morning about desire. Desire plays a very important part in the life of every person. We have desires at the natural level, but if we love the Lord, we have desires at the spiritual level also. A desire is not just a vague wish for something. It's a longing for something. So we know that the enemy always wants to stir up the desires of the flesh because the flesh and the spirit are in direct opposition to one another. And sadly, but really, your flesh will always be with you to the end of your days here on earth. In heaven, you'll be able to enjoy the Lord without all the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil. Hallelujah. So you have something in your life that is opposed to the will of God. And you have someone in your life who is devoted to the will of God because the Holy Spirit is given in order that the will of the Father and the Son might be outworked in our lives. To feed desire is to look forward to the fulfillment of that desire. So if you feed desires of the flesh, you look forward to satisfying the flesh. That can manifest itself in a whole series of different ways. It's not just sexual desire. There can be desire for things. There can be desire of many, 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 many kinds. The Holy Spirit wants to create in us desires for the will of God to be outworked in our lives. And that desire, the spiritual desire, comes out of the love that God has poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We all have to make the decision which set of desires we're going to fulfill. Sadly, in the lives of most believers, there is a mixture of the two. A desire to see the purpose of God, but desire also to satisfy some of their own soulish, fleshly desires. That leads to a kind of compromise which doesn't separate us from God but does prevent the best purposes of God from being outworked and fulfilled in our lives. So this is where the fire comes in. 
and why the fire is so important in our lives. Because the fire of the Holy Spirit fulfills a dual purpose. Now, we referred to that last night as the fire of God was coming upon us as we cried out to God. There's much, much more of the fire to come. Last night was just a little foretaste. But <clears throat> both aspects of the work of the fire of God are the evidences of his love for us. So, first of all, the fire purges or cleanses. So, in his love for us, the Holy Spirit wants to cleanse and purge out of our life, out of our lives, all the wrong desires. Now, the nature and the disposition of the heart is going to depend upon which set of desires in our lives that we're going to fulfill, or whether there's going to be mixture, or really a wholehearted devotion to what it is that God wants. So in his love, the Holy Spirit purges, cleanses the wrong desires. Now, he doesn't do that without our cooperation. You have to want that process. Jesus refers to the same process in a different way when he's talking about himself as the true vine and his father as the vine dresser. The vine dresser prunes even the fruitful branches that they may become more fruitful still. That pruning process is the same as the purging process of the fire of the Holy Spirit. It is how God does that. But Jesus makes it clear that he does it in response to his word. As we desire to see his word outworked in our lives, so we desire God to deal with the things in our lives that are a contradiction to his word. the wrong desires, the selfish desires, the proud desires, the conceited desires, the jealous desires, as well as any lustful desires. There's no sin, remember, in being tempted. The sin is yielding to the temptation. So you may have natural desires of the soul, of the flesh, but it's whether you feed them or not or seek to see those desires fulfilled or not that actually matters. Better not to have the desires at all. And that is where the cleansing fire of the Holy Spirit comes in. Because the more that fire actually affects our lives, the more our desires are changed. We find that we no longer desire what before we desired, if these desires are simply of the soul or of the flesh. In other words, you can fight desire, and if you fight desire, you will constantly lose the battle. You can suppress desire, but suppressing the wrong desires is not the same thing as being set free from them. So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit wants that 
purging, cleansing fire to actually destroy. This is the destroying aspect of fire. He wants to destroy all those wrong desires, all those wrong ambitions that are based upon self rather than on love for God and love for others. Now, at the same time that the fire of God wants to do this cleansing, purging work in us, he also inflames, stirs up our hearts in love for God. It isn't that he simply wants to take out the wrong desires. He wants to input into our hearts and lives the right desires. You can know what is right as a Christian without necessarily desiring what is right. But God's purposes are only going to be fulfilled in the way that he desires in our lives when we desire what is right, not simply know what is right. So as we read his word and we receive the revelation of the truth, we desire to see those truths outworked in practice in the people that we are, the things that we say, whatever we do, and the way in which we relate to others. In other words, the Holy Spirit cleanses us of what would produce bad fruit. And the fire of God at the same time stirs up the love of God in our hearts so that we bear the good fruit, the lasting fruit that will glorify God. Because Jesus used this analogy of the vine and the branches, <clears throat> we understand that God's purposes all the time are focused upon fruitfulness. Not just where we are in relationship to him as an end in itself, but our relationship with him is to give birth to the fruit that he wants to see in our lives. And the fruit is what the Holy Spirit does, not just in us, but through us. There has to be the outworking of the life within us that is going to impact the lives of other people in a variety of ways. Now, <clears throat> Paul says all this in a number of ways. One of, one of which is that God's purpose is to transform us into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Now, if you just stop for a moment and think, what does that mean? If we're going to be transformed into his likeness, then the Holy Spirit, because he says this happens by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to cleanse, purge out of us the wrong desires that are not like Jesus and is going to reinforce the right desires that are exactly like Jesus. And the scripture that we need to hold on to as we realize this process is to be worked out in our lives by the fire of God, by the Holy Spirit, is that we are as he is in the world. Now, that's not a statement of intent. God doesn't say, I intend you to be as he is in the world. He says you are to be, you are as he is in the world. This is what he has made us. 
So obviously there's a conflict of interest if we live to please ourselves and to satisfy our own desires. Now Jesus, of course, made this very clear when he talked to his disciples about what it meant to be a disciple. That if anyone would follow after him, he would have to deny himself. If you deny yourself, what do you do? You deny any desires you have that are in conflict with the desires of God for you. You deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after him. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we won't have natural desires. You can't live without natural desires because it's part of the nature of your soul life. But what God wants to purge out of our lives, to cleanse out of our lives, are the wrong desires that are really focused on using our soul life for ourselves to satisfy and please ourselves rather than to please God. Because the life of the Spirit has to be expressed through your soul life. You know, I've often drawn those charts for you of the Spirit, the soul, and the body. We have the fullness of God's life, or you have the fullness of God's life in your spirit. You have the fire of God in your spirit because God has poured his spirit into your spirit. He's brought your spirit alive with his spirit. To stir up the gift is to stir up your spirit so that the fire of God, the presence of God, the love of God, the power of God, all gets released more strongly into the life of your soul. But there are things in the soul life that resist that, especially if we focus upon ourselves and not upon Jesus. If we fix our eyes on what we want rather than on what he wants. There are a number of desires we have which are not necessarily sinful, but they're not helpful. And the scripture tells us that too. Uh, if they're not helpful, they're not going to contribute to the will of God in our lives, to the outworking of his purpose. Because we're spending time on things that are not helpful. They might seem to be neutral in terms of whether they're sinful or not. But they still don't contribute to the outworking of the will of God in our lives. And this, you see, is where every one of us has to make a very far-reaching decision. How far are you prepared to be devoted to the will of God in your life? To what extent are you prepared to give your life to Jesus so that he can work in and through your life in the way that he desires? That is not just a one-time decision. It's a constant decision. It's something that we have to reaffirm again and again and again. And there will be times in your Christian life when you realize that you have compromised to a certain extent. I've had to face times like that myself. It can happen in an insidious way without you even realizing that it's taking place. But then something happens or, or God speaks to you in a certain way 
And it's like he brings you up short and he says, you have strayed or fallen short of where you were, of what you were doing, of my best purpose for you. That's where the cleansing fire of the Holy Spirit comes in again. Because it's not just a question of saying, well, Lord, thank you that by your blood you've forgiven me. But you want to be restored to the place where you were. You want God to even take you further on in his purposes. So according to my Bible, you have nothing to fear, for God has redeemed you. He has called you by name to follow him. But you see, the scripture says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And you are mine. And that's the point. You are his. You belong to him. He paid the price with his own blood. He literally, the scripture says, purchased you for God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, how do you glorify God in your body? Well, your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your spiritual worship. What does that mean? That you're living to fulfill his desires, not your desires. And that can be even not fulfilling good desires. If those good desires of the soul are going to get in the way of God's desires for you in the spirit. So, <clears throat> let's understand the love of God. That scripture we read just now, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. What does it mean to say that God loves you? It's not an emotional feeling that he has for you. His love is intensely practical. He expresses that love in giving, in being merciful and gracious to us, merciful in the cleansing of the fire, gracious in what he then imparts by his Holy Spirit, But to say that God loves you is to say that God is concerned for my highest good. So that raises the question, well, what is your highest good? And if we were to summarize the teaching of Jesus, we would say that your highest good is bearing much fruit for the glory of the Father. That's your highest good. And the reward for that, because there is a reward for that, is that you will receive the crown of life and you will reign with him in his glory for all eternity. So God seeks your highest good now because he's seeking your highest good eternally. Now, what stands between the fruit that we bear now and that life in eternity with Jesus is the judgment of God. And at the time of judgment, 
All our works are tested by, by what? By fire. The works of wood, hay, stubble get burnt up. They're the works of the soul of the flesh. The works of silver, gold, and precious stone withstand the fire. Now, you see, what God is doing amongst us already this week is a testing by fire of what is going on in our lives now so that we get rid of the wood, hay, stubble and that we live our lives bearing the fruit that is silver, gold, and precious stones. So when it comes to the final judgment by fire, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> because at that time, you can't change anything that has been. You can't go back and say, if only, or I should have or I wish I had. It's too late then. So, <clears throat> this, this might sound a strange thing, but I, I found it to be exceedingly helpful in my life, so I'll share this with you. It's a question of understanding we are an omega people with an omega mindset. Now, Jesus is the first, the alpha, and the omega. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Alpha is the first. <coughs> what that means is that with our mindset, the decisions we make as to what desires we're going to fulfill, the way in which we're going to live, that that is actually influenced deeply because we are an omega people, we have our, our eyes, our minds, our hearts set on the end result. That we're not people that just live for the happiness of the moment, the sort of hedonist lifestyle of the world, where you take what you want now you do what pleases you now, but you realize that what pleases you now might be inconsistent with being an omega people. Can you understand what I'm saying? So all the time we have really in the back of our minds this eternal destiny that God has for us. You see, it's not just a question of, well, praise God, I'm saved and I'm going to go to heaven. Out of his love for you, God is concerned that you have the richest reward in heaven that it's possible for you to have. Because it's quite clear from what Jesus says that each one will be rewarded according to what he has done. So <clears throat> it's not a question of trusting in ourselves or, or trying to produce fruit that will lead to a good reward. It doesn't work like that. It's all about being yielded to the will of God, surrendered to the life and power of the Spirit, allowing the fire of the Holy Spirit to really be working through our lives so that the desires that are most important to us the desires upon which we focus are the desires that God has for us. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said to the disciples at the Last Supper, these things I have said to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now, he said that, you see, just after saying, you will remain in my love if you obey my commands, just as I remain in the Father's love by obeying his commands. These things I have spoken to you, 
that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Obedience is not, as we know, legalistic obedience to a written code, as was the case with the law of the Old Testament. But Jesus speaks of this obedience of love. Because the love creates the desires, the right desires to see the will of God fulfilled, to see the outworking of his will and purpose, to see the fire of God so evident in our lives that we touch the lives of other people with the love, the life, and the power of God. Now this is God's purpose. It's always been his purpose. But this is the season. God has been saying to us, this is a new season. Not just a new year, but a new season. This is a season then when we're going to see the outworking of these things. Because that is what produces the multiplication, the harvest, the abundance. I want you to understand that the multiplication is people. It's not things, it's not events. It's not healings, it's people. The harvest is people. The abundance is, that God, is all that God gives us so that we are able to reach more people. God's heart desire is for people. Why should he send his son to die on the cross for sinners, not for the righteous. He said, I haven't come to save the righteous, I've come to save sinners. Why? Because his desire is for people. He does not want anyone to be lost. Now he knows that not all will be saved because not all will believe in him. But his desire, his desire, is that everyone should be saved. So even God does not have his desires fully satisfied. He has done what is necessary through the crucifixion for salvation to become possible for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. You can never add to what God has already done on the cross. But our mission is not to get to heaven. Our mission is to take others with us to heaven. For our lives to be witnesses, to impact the lives of others through a whole variety of ways. It doesn't make us all evangelists, but we are all witnesses. But through prayer, through our witness, through our love, through our compassion, Every day of my life, one of the groups of people I pray for and thank God for is all those that are fulfilling his word to lay down their lives in love for others. I praise God for that because I know the cost of that. I've sought to live that way myself. I know what it involves. I know the cost of it. I know the value of it. I know the satisfaction, the fulfillment that it brings if you know that you are to as fully as you are able devoting yourself to the plan and purpose of God. But you know I've said to you before and God reminded me of this the other day, God does much through the few and little through the many. And most of the fruit that is actually produced is by the few who are ready to lay down their life in love for others. Those are the people that are really fruitful for God. Because they're not living, for, first and foremost, for themselves. Of course, they have natural desires. Of course, 
they have soulish desires and so on, but the whole focus of their lives is to live for the glory of God by fulfilling his will, by fulfilling, therefore, his desires for them. Now, I'm not saying to you anything that you don't really know. I'm just reminding you of what you've already been taught. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it clear when he talked to the disciples about the nature of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in our lives is that first and foremost, he wants to remind us of the truth. Yes, he is the Holy Spirit who guides us into all the truth, but having guided us into the truth, he keeps reminding us of the truth. He reminds us of everything that Jesus has said and done. And it's only by that constant reminder that we keep our focus really on what it is that God wants. Now, there's a lot of prayer that is going to be happening during these three weeks, not only among us, but in the whole church and all the congregations. We want that prayer to be fruitful. But you see, the fruitfulness, the effectiveness, if you like, of prayer does not only depend upon what we pray, but upon the nature of those who are doing the praying. The prayers of the righteous avail much. Actually, what the scripture says is the fervent prayers of the righteous are effective. We want fervent prayer, prayer full of the fire of God, that means. But <clears throat> coming out of lives that are made righteous through the mercy of God, through the precious blood of Jesus, but out of those who are intent on living in righteousness. So it may be that during these three weeks of prayer and fasting, I'll withdraw the word maybe. It will be the case that during these three weeks of prayer and fasting, God is going to do a number on you concerning your desires. There's going to be a refining of those desires. He's going to kick out the ones that are a hindrance to his best purposes. And he's going to inflame your heart with fresh desire for him and for his will. And that will lead to a greater devotion for him and a great dedication to his purposes. Now all this, we're going to pray in a moment, but all this, you see, is really <clears throat> the outworking of his kingdom life in our lives. What does it mean when Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you? The kingdom of God, as we know, is not a place. It's the sovereign rule and reign of God. So, if we were to use spiritual language, we would say that Jesus Christ has come to live in your heart, to enthrone himself in your life, 
that he might exercise his rule and reign through you. That's what it means. Now, obviously, he cannot extend, he cannot exercise, he cannot demonstrate his rule and reign through things that are a contradiction to his desires. So he can't reign in our life through the things that are a contradiction to his will and purpose. It's only as our desires come in line with his desires that then he can exercise that rule and reign. Now what does that mean in practice? What is the outworking of that? What is the fruitfulness of that? The fruitfulness of that is the authority and the power of God is expressed in our prayer, in our witness, in our words and our activities. But first and foremost in our prayer. God wants you to pray with authority. This is why Jesus said, you know, when you pray, you speak to the mountain, you command it to move. That's authority. And the more your desires are in line with his desires, the more he can rule and reign in your life, the more, therefore, you can exercise that authority. Well, it's not a matter of speaking the words, but speaking with the authority that causes the mountains to be moved, that causes circumstances to be changed. And that's the kind of prayer that God wants to see among his people during these three weeks and beyond, of course. But I believe that during these three weeks, <clears throat> God wants to deepen, improve, extend the quality of the prayer of everybody in kingdom faith. <clears throat> that by the 26th of January, we will be praying as a body of people with greater power and authority than we're praying at this time. Not simply because we've done more praying, but because of what God has been doing in us as we prayed. And so, just to round all this off, that brings us back to where we started. Because our desires are going to affect to what extent that actually happens in the life of each one of us. One of the things that God constantly reminds us of is that his will never gets outworked through striving and straining, but only by trusting. And what we're doing is trusting in his love. I want you to understand that this needs to be a time of fire, the fire of God coming upon us, being manifested, being revealed in our lives, the way we were talking about last night, increasingly during these coming weeks. But I want you to understand that that is only another way of saying that he wants his love to be more fully expressed in our lives. That there is no, there is no separation or division between the fire and the love. The fire is the love. It's the love that purges. It's the love that cleanses. It's the love that kicks out of our lives the stuff that is a contradiction to his purpose. And the fire is the love that stirs up our hearts, creates in us the desire, the longing to see the plans and purposes of God fulfilled in our lives. So the fire of God, the, the love of God is not a gentle breeze, but a mighty violent wind, as we saw in the scripture yesterday. It's powerful. 
It's powerful. And yet at the same time, brings this deep sense of peace and of humility before God. Jesus was the man of authority and power, but he was the one who described his heart as being humble and gentle. So we have these humble hearts before God, but humble hearts that are inflamed, impassioned, filled with the fire of God. because we really want those wrong desires to disappear from our lives altogether. So we're not having to fight what no longer exists. But not to be left in a neutral position but for those desires to be replaced by his desires. His desires for us, for your highest good, for your highest eternal good as Omega people. Amen. What a wonderful calling on our lives. So let's all stand and I want you just to be <coughs> just still for a few moments first. Just close your eyes so you're not distracted by anything around you. Now, God's got a question for you. What desires have you been fighting? You see, if the desires are good desires, the desires of God for you, you never have to fight them. But if there are desires that you have to fight, that you might have tried to suppress, you might have cried out to God, oh Lord, forgive me, again and again. If there's no such desires, you are blessed. You can come and take over and I'll go and sit down. And then the next question the Lord has for you, are you willing to give up those desires so that you no longer desire them? They no longer exist. Are you willing for the fire of my spirit to purge and cleanse you of those desires? The nature of the flesh can never change. You must understand that. The flesh will always have the desires of the flesh. Always. Those desires can never change. But of course, what God is talking about is indulging those desires, giving in to those desires. We say no to anything that is a contradiction to his purpose. Are you willing for that? For the fire of God to purge, to cleanse, for the Father 
to prune those things out of your branch. And the next question he has for every one of us is, do you want me to replace those desires with my desires for you? Are you willing to submit yourself to my desires? Because my desires for you are the best for you. My love demands the best for you. Lord, let the fire of your spirit cleanse out of our hearts and lives the yielding to any desires that are in contradiction to your will, your purpose, that now our whole focus may be upon you and your desires for each one of us. For we know, Lord, that when we focus on your desires for us, we will prosper. We will be able to live in your abundance. That there will be no more compromise, no more half-heartedness, no divided hearts, no double-mindedness. But thank you that during these 21 days of prayer and fasting, you want to bring us all and to bring all the people in the church, to bring us all through to a renewed focus upon you and upon your will and upon the fruitfulness that you want to produce in our lives. All through the working of your Holy Spirit. Now just get yourself before God in whatever. Pray in whatever way you need to pray to put these things into practice. You can stand, you can kneel, you can sit, you can do whatever so long as you engage your heart with his heart so that he will rule and reign. But don't, don't, don't look at yourself that's not going to accomplish anything. Just bring yourself to him. Yield those desires to him. And you may even want to say, Lord, show me what your desires are for me at this time not just in the future but what are your desires for me now in this season
no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. And how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, We are like him. Just stop pouring out your heart to God and just remain silent thinking about yourself accomplishes nothing. 
just really start to speak out words. You don't have to speak so loudly that everyone hears you, but just let that flow of prayer, of praise, of thanksgiving flow out of your heart to him. Lord, you are the desire of my heart. Your will, your purpose. Your glory, Lord. My desire is to please you to honor you, to glorify you, to be fruitful in the way that you desire. Thank you that you've, by your grace and mercy, put to death those desires that stand in contradiction to your desires. So they are not entertained anymore, given space anymore. Thank you, Lord, this is the work of your spirit, the work of your mercy, of your love, of your grace, because you desire my highest good. Thank him that you don't live to please men, but to please God. Not to try to make yourself look good in the eyes of others, but in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come and let's praise him. Basta calare a letto con lo sottori, sandare a letto con lo sottori, santo. Basta calare a letto con lo sottori, sandare a letto con lo sottori, sandare a letto con lo Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Polaria letto con lo sotto di Sant'Aria letto con lo sotto di Santo. Polaria letto con lo sotto di Santo con lo sotto di Santo. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Santo Bacala Sintoma. Come and let the fire purge and cleanse. Thank you, Lord, for the fire. Thank you for the cleansing power of the fire. For the transforming fire. That destroys the things in our lives that are opposed to your will. Hallelujah. Burns them up. The wood, the hay, the stubble. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> those things of self that are of no account. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They are not going to sway our lives. They are not going to influence our lives. They are not going to dictate the course of events.
Balataria Leto Golozota. We thank you, Lord, your spirit is going to lead us. As the sons of God, we are led by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Your fire, the fire of your spirit, is going to lead us into the outworking of your best and finest purposes. Pura la basoto di sandaria leto galazoto. That you inflame our hearts with all the right desires. Pulaaria leto galazoto di sandaria leto galazoto. That our desires come in line with your desires. Pura la basataria leto galazoto di sandum. That we are one with you, Lord. Pura la basoto di sandaria leto galazoto di sandum. Basta calaria leto galazoto di sandum. Basta calaria leto galazoto di sandum. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pura leto galazoto di sandaria leto galazoto di sandum. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let him know you're around here. Hallelujah. Oh, you want him to rule and reign. Rule and reign in my heart. Rule and reign in my life. Thank you, you have set your throne. You have enthroned yourself in my heart. Thank you that you have established your rule and reign within me, within my heart, according to your word. Thank you, Lord, you're going to rule and reign from within me. Hallelujah. Come on, pray it over your life. You're going to reign over me. You're going to reign in me. You will reign through me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let all that is within me bless your holy name. Let all that is within me bless your holy name. Let all that is within me bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my inmost being, praise his holy name. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And he's established his throne in you too. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, you're so good. We realize you've got such a wonderful agenda for us this week, during these three weeks, during the rest of term, during the rest of the year, during the rest of our lives. Praise your holy name. That you've never planned bad things for any of your children. You only plan good things for us. And we bless you, Lord, for the outworking of all that is good. Praise your holy name. Kola la basotori sandaria leto golazotori sandum. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, there's a, well, there's most scriptures. He says in Isaiah, but he also says in Psalm 103, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. You know, the wind blows out of our lives. The wind of the Spirit blows out of our lives, all the negative things, as well as imparting all the positive things. Hallelujah. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you're working in us, all that you're going to go on working in us during these coming days and weeks. And we praise your holy name. Come on, can we just praise the Lord? Let's just open our mouths and praise him. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papa Papara Sandaria Leto Gulazota di Santa. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, that all your desires for us are good. That in all things you work together for our good. And we praise you, we bless you. And thank you, Lord, that our lives are going to be abundantly fruitful for your glory, honor, and praise. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources from Kingdom Faith and our other audio and video podcasts, please visit www.kingdomfaith.com.